Um, all right, so let's get started. So the, the, the name of the presentation is a blockchain-enabled decentralized social network, which might be ambitious, but uh, to, to start with, I think the best start is to probably highlight the, the problem that we're facing. And let's see, perfect. Um, so the, the problem is probably familiar to a lot of people here, which is the problem of centralized identities. And uh, what it basically means, uh, so we have a couple of bullet points, kind of, it, it's more than this, and, and the topic is kind of um, subjective, but uh, in a nutshell, it's basically identity that you don't own. It's, it's identity that's provided to you by someone else, be that Facebook, be that Google. So it's the identity that you don't create yourself, it's the identity that you can't revoke yourself, it's the identity that can be taken away from you or censored or uh, amongst other things. So this type of identity, as, as mentioned, is, is rather vulnerable to censorship. Which basically means if Facebook doesn't like you, if any identity provider doesn't like you, they can just block you or delete you, and there's pretty much nothing most of the time you can do about it. Uh, another problem is that there's no real data ownership, as in all of your data is stored on the identity provider's servers. So uh, if you say, I want to delete a, face uh, a Facebook photo, you have to basically put your trust into Facebook that they will indeed delete that photo, and that they are not storing it somewhere. Um, so I think this is straightforward. Trust is required, so uh, mostly trust towards your identity provider. So you really have to trust your identity provider. You have to make sure that they don't do anything with your data that they, they don't claim or that they claim they're not doing something. You, you, you cannot be sure about these things. And another problem is uh, limited portability. So in a nutshell, uh, a lot of times some identity providers will not allow you to export your data. A simple example would be again Facebook. Well, Facebook has a certain export profile feature, but if you'd like to fully migrate from one service to another, a lot of times you're not able to get all of your data from them. It's a bit difficult to, to migrate fully. So, and this is how most identity providers work in a nutshell. This being the users and that being the identity provider, which provides them with the identities and amongst other things, hosts their files. And uh, at least this is a kind of like a very conventional, hyper-centralized um, system. And the solution to that is, is a word that's probably mentioned a lot all over the place. It's uh, self-sovereign identity which uh, in a nutshell basically means that you have control over your identity. So uh, you don't rely on any external service to create, delete, or manage your identity. You can do it yourself. When authenticated against, uh, against some websites on the internet, you can authenticate with your identity. It's quite a bug, generic form formulation. But, uh, and you don't really have to, to rely on some third party to, to handle this for you. And again, no, no external service can revoke or censor your identity. And the user should be able to always access their data, uh, which is, I think, a very important point. So the data should uh, ideally be always on the user side rather than on some um, identity provider's website. And, and it should be portable and not lock, uh, locked down to one domain or on one uh, location. So this, is, this transposes directly to what we mentioned before. And uh, this, there's a couple of ways to do self-sovereign identity. There's probably been concepts uh, for a while. And one of the ways is, uh, heavily promoted by uh, a development team at uh, MIT, led by Tim Berners-Lee, which is uh, the solid spec or the social linked data specification. It relies on a couple of, um, uh, of factors, which we'll get into in a second. So this is ideally how a decentralized identity system would look like, where every owner, every user stores their files locally, and also their identity locally. Th this symbol here is actually a, a server, a personal server that they're running. Um, it, this particular picture ground stands for the solid server, so it's a, sol uh, it's a server, de again, developed by the solid team. Um, so to, to fully understand the, the stack, we need to kind of get the grasp of the, the basic building blocks. The very basic building block is uh, a web ID, which is quite straightforward. It's an HTTP URI which describes an agent or an a entity. So this is basically your login. This is your identity in a nutshell. So, uh, a couple of valid web IDs, for example, would be eugenio.webid.telecom.de, profile card, me, that's a bit irrelevant, but uh, and another one would be, for example, Tim Burns Lee's uh, web ID, which would be, uh, yeah, I'm not going to read it, but this is what it is. So there's a different, there's a bit of a distinction here. The first one is actually provided by identity provider, but that's something we can talk about in, in a bit. Um, so this, um, this HTTP URI needs to resolve to a profile document. So it needs to resolve to a document that basically describes you, who you are, and uh, perhaps some uh, primitive amounts of data, and also link to some other documents that further 
describe you. And those other documents can then have some specific access control rules associated with them. So this part has to be public. So it, it, it can be accessed by anyone to get some primitive information about you. And then the further exploration can be restricted by access control rules. And then um, it's, it's a unique identifier due to the nature of how uh, domain names work. So no other entity would have the same uh, web ID as you. You can have different web IDs uh, in the same domain name, so uh, subdomains that would be perfectly valid, but uh, it is in a natural and unique identifier. Um, so the web ID really defines where your identity is stored. It, it basically says that there's this URI which describes you, and that's where the entry point to your identity should be stored. Now, it doesn't really define how your data should be formatted, doesn't really define anything. It, it only says it is there. Um, in, in a system like this where every agent hosts their own identity, it, it is imperative to have interoperability. So if an um, agent wants to retrieve some data from you, he should know how you store your data, he should be able to parse it, read it, and make sense of it. And if a service provider wants to do the same, he should be able to do the same thing. So uh, basically, they have to speak the same language in a nutshell. They all have to um, understand each other. And the solution to this comes pretty natural, which is actually linked data or uh, yeah, linked data, which um, you can actually see one example of linked data here. Linked data is a way of formulating statements uh, or pieces of information using uh, triples. So a triple has a subject, a predicate, and an object, and uh, it. it Defines something. So in this particular case, it basically says that I know you are him, who's somewhere there. It's <laughs> a lot of people here. Um, so uh, this is the, the general idea. You know, linked data needs to be used to, well, should be used to, to describe you. So your profile ideally should be stored in um, RDF or uh, yeah, and a different uh, serialization format such as Turtle or RDF XML, but it should be valid linked data. It's the first point. And then there's a second point that ACL files, so access control uh, lists, so files that define who is allowed to do what with some files that you store on your system are also valid um, linked data. And linked data in tandem with web ID simply makes sense because link, linked data, the nature of linked data is um, addressing entities by a certain URI, uh, URI. So every agent, every entity is defined by a URI. Predicates are also defined by a URI. They're clearly defined in, in a number of ontologies of predicates. Um, so if you take linked data and you plug in the web ID, which uses URI to identify users, that works. Um, it, it, it's an easy way to uh, show social relationships like this, because now, a parser could see this statement and then could jump to Joachim's card, which is also valid linked data, parse that and jump on and on and on and make meaningful, perhaps extract some meaningful information out of that. So exactly, that's, that's basically the stack that is defined by social linked data or solid. So they use RDF to store your file, to store your, to, to, to serialize your information. They use uh, web IDs to point at you, so as identifiers for entities in the system, they use access control lists to manage authorization, which basically is just another RDF file that says that this and this and these agents are allowed to do this and this and these things on these files, everything being a valid URI. A good thing that comes out of SOLID is uh, the elimination of a network attack. So in the conventional systems, we, we have the so-called network attack, where everyone is using a social network. That's the reason why other people using it as well, you know, why do you use WhatsApp and not Signal? Because everyone uses WhatsApp and so on and so forth, or Facebook, or uh, the, the examples are endless. Uh, Solid envisions a world where every user has their data on their side in a pre predefined format, and applications can simply hook into that data. So applications can simply um, request access to your uh, server, to your user space, get the data, and, and do some computations on that, or perhaps display it in a graph, or perhaps it depends on the application, really, really application specific. And uh, as a result of that, you have an ecosystem where everyone has their identities, which they build over time. They want their one identity, and then a bunch of applications that they can use to manage different areas and aspects of their identity. And different, um, yeah, different functionality comes from different apps, so you don't have to use these big monoliths anymore. And then we talk about Yolocom now, so <laughs> that's us. Uh, how do we fit in into this picture? And uh, we'll also do a very short demonstration if the 
internet allows us to do so. Um, so first of all, we are a, a tool that allows you to uh, modify, edit your uh, web ID profile. So we're a tool to visualize your web ID profile, to, to modify this user space, the data space, to, to manage it in a meaningful and easy way. And uh, we also allow for certain, um, for certain interactions. So it, I think it'll be a bit clearer if we just do a very quick demo on that. So here we have the very, a very primitive demo where uh, we have this one node. Uh, so this is Eugenius, this basically is uh, my node. This renders the files on, uh, on the server that I own. So the application basically uh, gets access to my data <coughs> and renders it. So at the moment I'm a simple node which doesn't really um, do anything, doesn't really have any, any connection. So we can do things like, obviously we can look at my profile where there's some primitive information. So this would be my, de uh, my web ID, my email, and that's about it really. It, it's a very sort of blank profile. We can do things like link to other valid uh, web ID profiles. So I think um, we'll link to probably two or three to, dis to, to really explain the interoperability aspect. The first of one will be probably Joachim. So this is Joachim's web ID, if I didn't misspell it, Joachim web ID, you'll come back to you, me. So we can create a link to Joachim. So this basically gets information from, uh, from Joachim's personal server. And in this case, this is hosted on a server owned by Yolocom for uh, development purposes. It's just easier this way. But I'll show two examples with uh, people who self-host their identities. Um, so this just gets access to Joachim's data, to whatever data Joachim made public to me. And uh, if I go to Joachim's profile, we can see that we can explore his data, which has a number of connections to a lot of other entities, so all of these being other people, some of them self-hosting, some of them hosting their data in an identity provider, and then some general nodes that he created, some pieces of information he's uploaded to his, to his uh, server. So if I navigate back to me, so this is the example of uh, linking to someone who's on, uh, on a server that we host, because it's easier for us to do it so in, uh, for development reasons. But we can, uh, for example, a good example would be Tim Berners-Lee. So this is his card that he made public online, and you can also see the third permutation of this card. So all of his information, information about him is basically encoded here, such as his location, phone number, and so on and so forth. Um, so if we take this URI and link to it, um, add the hash it's important. We send a request to his personal server to get some data, and whatever data he made public comes back to us. Um, and we obviously can render some of that data in. Uh, so this is what we've kind of extracted from his profile file. So this is quite uh, simple computations, really. It's nothing, nothing crazy. And the last example, we have another uh, identity that's hosted on a freedom box right there. So it's the thing that kind of has a circle around it. It's a personal server. It's supposed to act as a little personal server, rather solid server on it. So if I connect to it, and we have this nice little feature. It's really not that impressive. But if you, if you send a GET request, an HTTP request, if you get data from the Freedom box, it, it spins, the, the little light spins. So you might uh, see the moment when I request the, the data that's stored on the Freedom box from whoever owns it. So I think the name for this one would be yolocom.freedombox.me. If I'm not mistaken, at least. <coughs> oh, I, I am mistaken. Allow me again. Mm. Let's say I'm doing something. Hmm. Last second. <laughs> two, 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 two. Hmm. The server is down. <laughs> Thank you, Demo Gods. <laughs> but. Uh, Even with the cables there, perhaps that is the reason. Mm. I'm not sure if it's worth recovering it now, but the, 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 there's an identity on there. Trust me, when you access it, the light blinks. It's the coolest thing ever. Man, it's really annoying, though. Um, yeah, but. The camera is not supposed to work, and yours, yours always did, so. Ideal <laughs> demo. Yeah, but yeah, uh, sorry, maybe we can get it working a bit later. We can show it to you if people want to see things blink. But um, <laughs> this is what it, it basically does in a nutshell. So you can. You can connect to other people who have their identities on, on different 
uh, in different locations. So a, a very extreme example would be the Freedom Box, which is a server that is self-host. It has a number of um, privacy-related functionality features on it. It's developed by the Freedom Box Foundation. Um, you could host your identity really anywhere, ideally, obviously self-hosting it. Um, and talking about access control, so access control rights, I'll create something very primitive. I'll create a node, which is this node. It's just a mm, file we basically upload to our solid server, to our data storage. And to that node, I might even, uh, I'll be very ambitious and upload a picture, and hopefully they'll make it there. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this is a file we've uploaded to our file system. It's a, to our solid server. It's, it's not that crazy, but what we can do, so if we go to this test node, um, we can uh, copy the URL that it is at. And wait. I want to show that this is... Um, mm. So this URL is... This, this is basically where our node is, which is publicly available. So people can... Can get it. Anyone can connect to this node. Anyone can visualize this node. Anyone can uh, can see this node, which is what you would expect. Um, so what you can do then, you can edit the privacy settings on this node. And uh, at the moment it's public. I can I can make it private, where only I can access this node. Or I can actually add particular atomic authorization rules to the people I know, with the general just web IDs out there in the world. So if I allow Tim Berners Lee read access, <laughs> can somebody anyone has contact with him? Can you ping him? Tell him that he has read access to this. Uh, to this. Everyone does. What six? Oh, right. am, I, am I the only one who's left out? But uh, so basically now only he has access to this file, and if I try to curl it from um, the outside, uh, I, I get denied. I don't have the authorization unless I I prove that I am indeed Tim Burns Lee through the predefined authorization protocols. And this is in, enforced on a, this is not enforced on an application level, obviously, this is enforced by the solid server um, that the user is running. So this is in a nutshell kind of the, the thing. So it goes a bit deeper than that. You can really spend some time uh, tailoring your identity, making, you know, you spend kind of some time um, adding valuable information about you. And then you can use this identity to, to interact with a lot of applications that are out there in the wild. You don't have to create a new identity with every application you're using. You don't have to register again. The, the dream would be you basically go and you say you connect with my web ID and it would be kind of like the Facebook connect, but not evil. Um, so to talk, basically presented what we do, what, what we are all about, but we've encountered a number of problems while well doing that. And... Um, <coughs> And also a couple of questions. So the big question kind of is, uh, is the identity mod uh, model defined by solid truly self-sovereign? And to some people it is to a certain extent because you don't rely on a centralized identity provider. To some people it isn't because you still rely on DNS. Um, and, and some people would say that you even rely on an electricity provider and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the big sort of weak point here to a certain extent is that it, it does depend on DNS. This is one problem of the current system. And another problem of the current system is that your identifier is, is tightly coupled with the transfer protocol, with the, with, the, with the protocol. So your identity is HTTPS forward slash forward slash whatever. This is the problem. There's no layer of abstraction between your identifier and the protocol. So there's no layer of abstraction between who you are and where you are. And this is problematic in case your, uh, your server goes down. You want to change to a different web ID. What happens if you want to change to a different uh, domain name? What happens all of the connections you've built until now are broken? Because uh, don't worry. I'm not gonna say <laughs> I'm not gonna say broken again because <laughs> all of the connections you've built so far are broken because now they point to to an invalid area. So this is kind of a problem that they're so tightly coupled. Migration is indeed a bit problematic. Uh, another problem is authentication protocols that are employed at the moment. So into these, we're not going to dive too deeply, but to make it very straight, like very briefly explain this, the authentication protocol currently employed is WebID TLS, which basically uses client certificates to authenticate. Um, and I guess, I don't know if, if anyone is familiar with client certificates, they suck. Um, so this is, um, this is a problem. There's no easy way to, to terminate a session. There's no easy way to log out. There's no easy way to do a lot of things. So to abstract this problem, we've built uh, a proxy, which the user self-hosts and which we use as well. 
for development purposes, but the proxy is, is, is quite straightforward, really. The proxy stores your uh, client certificate, your keys, and then you proxy the request through the proxy, the proxy signing stuff, so you don't have to see this, um, this, this all the, the pop-up all the time. There's easy way to terminate your session. Should you trust a centralized proxy? Obviously not. Self-hosted uh, would, be, would be the correct solution here. So uh, this has aspects of the web of trust. There's a lot of agents interacting between each other. You can link to other people. You can give permissions to one another person. <coughs> um, the, the idea of reputation and claims comes kind of natural to this. So it would be really cool if agents could state something about another agent. And this is possible to a certain extent with the current implementation. The truth is that this, uh, it's still on file systems. It's on servers. So there's no, f in case of hijacks, in, in case of uh, uh, servers being compromised, in case of malicious agents being, uh, agents being present, it's a bit... It's a bit difficult, so there's no one way to fully verify that the data hasn't been tampered with at least. Another, so this basically results out of that, so making claims, there's a way to do claims. Now, with the current solid infrastructure, the question is, could it be improved? And uh, making payments is something that kind of comes to your mind as well, because this is all about sharing information, this is all about sharing data, so it's easy to envision scenarios where you would want to share something in return for some price, uh, perhaps even having a service provider like, I don't know, Facebook, uh, actually not right, too much bad things about Facebook, Google Plus, uh, asking you, uh, do you want to provide me your address? I'm going to pay you this and that much. Or do you want to, to, to give me access to your list of friends? I'm going to do this and that. So there's a potential sort of LA for, uh, for payments. But the biggest issue is, is DNS uh, dependency. And this is a strong coupling between who you are and where you are. So what we do here now, we were together with Fabian, who's going to come in a minute, is uh, we kind of started looking at, at it, it's only sort of in the starting phase. So there's no revolution coming, so waiting for that. <laughs> Might go out of smoke a bit. But uh, we were kind of looking at ways to, uh, to improve what we currently have, perhaps to, 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 to remove some of the dependency on some, on some centralized services, things, things like that. And I guess Fabian, you can probably come out and... Yeah. I'm going to go try and figure out where that doesn't work. Uh, I, I do it at the keyboard. Uh, you, might, you might wonder when, uh, where is the fucking blockchain here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very strong introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, Lilo configure there may be a solution for those problems and even more problems um, with Ethereum. So um, they got a little bit of funding to work with, with me from Fraunhofer and my colleague Manuel here together. So we can investigate a little bit how maybe Ethereum can solve some problems. And um, yeah, this is the big picture. It's, a, it's a, like an extract of what, what Eugenio presented. But there's somehow <coughs> the digital identity in the blockchain. And there are maybe third parties involved for payment and such things. And um, very important, again, is this web ID proxy um, because, again, the web ID is very it's complicated to use. Nobody actually does it, you have to install something in the browser, certificate and so on. So, and this is also an issue you may want to consult with the blockchain. And we wrote down some general considerations about it in the first place. Um, the, the, the biggest problem is how can Ethereum be integrated within the given technology stack. So it's a linked data stack, it's DNS based, it's basically a completely different thing. And the second question is how can a digital identity be represented in Ethereum? Then how does this affect the sign up and login process? And um, will it be secure because it's public, it's a public blockchain? How can we map claims and respective verifications because this is a potential use case for, for the Yolocom software? And especially very important is how can we search for other identities? Because now you need this web ID if you, if you would put it in a central instance, you have a central instance again, so but you, you just need it. Like if you type in your Achim web ID Yolocom. And yeah, what we first did is some kind of state of the art analysis. You probably know some of the projects, I bet, especially Uport, and but the landscape of the landscape of people working with future identities and digital identities is very big, but we focused on the most prominent ones. And uh, Blockstack, it's a decentralized app platform based on blockchains. Consensus is a company behind Uport and other Ethereum uh, products. And important also, very interesting, is um, 
JSON Web Tokens. The viewport, if you don't know it, um, viewport is the similar approach. They want to do digital identities in the blockchain, in the premium blockchain. And the main vision there is especially, uh, it's, a com uh, it's uh, similar to our vision that you want to replace common username and password login system. You just want to log in in a different way so you don't have to remember the password all the time. And their concept is to have a smartphone. You have the private key on the smartphone. And you have like, like with the WhatsApp back, uh, app, if you know it, you, you scan a QR code and then you authenticate it with the, with the blockchain identity. But uh, for now, it's like this. If your smartphone gets lost, your identity gets lost. They are working on a recovery process, which is not in place. We actually talked to the report guys. Um, I'm not going into detail about this. Um, they, they have a proxy contract, and you can recover your identity because your actual identity is somewhere here. And you have this little social network, which has parts of your private key, and you can recover it. So they are heavily working on key recovery, which is also an issue for us. Um, that's basically the biggest issue of all of this, because if you have a, somehow a digital identity in the blockchain, um, you're facing the issue uh, how to log in, how to uh, do, I, do I authenticate against it. And um, we talked to Ethereum guys here, we talked to Uport, and basically it comes down to this, you still, have to save your private key somewhere. There's no, actually there's no way around it. You can do it in a, in a browser add-on, you can do it in this Ethereum Mist browser, you can have it on a smartphone, you can write it down. But this is like some of the conclusion for our little project that you still have to do it. This is related to Zuko's triangle, you might know it. It's in a decentralized system, if you have an identifier, it's it's uh, either decentralized or insecure, or it's secure and human meaningful. You cannot have three or three of them. And we have a decentralized system which is secure, but our identifier is still um, not that human meaningful. <coughs> so what we did, um, we decided very early because our project is just five months, um, that we cannot change the solid and web ID infrastructure. We have to keep it as it is. It's based on DNS, it's based on link data. So we designed an intermediate solution. So it's a step towards a completely self sovereign identity. So we introduced a digital identity in Ethereum. We took concepts from Uport, Blockstack, DID. And we didn't use Uport because we didn't use it directly because it's a closed system somehow. That this app, you need to use this app and they advise us that we are not, it's not a good idea to use the contracts directly because they cannot ensure the security if you don't use their app. So we did our own contracts that are based on their concept in a way. And what we're doing, we are storing the web ID URL Eugenio mentioned just as an attribute in the blockchain identity. And we are also putting the encrypted private key there. So you're getting your identity it's somehow self-sovereign. You have it in your blockchain, encrypted. And we can put in additional attributes like claims and verifications, and um, this comes down that little sister acts as a light wallet. So the app you have just seen is then a light wallet, and this is an intermediate step towards a complete self-sovereign identity. <laughs> and again, the overall architecture, we have the Yolo app, we have the light wallet, we have a gas node, which is at the moment central, but you can have it uh, on your own system as well. We have personal identity contracts. We will also offer the seed storage. The seed is there to, to get your private key. It's just a service, so you don't have to write it down. And we have this web ID proxy, which uh, will not store any longer the, the keys of the web ID, but uh, the keys are in the, in the contract. And um, just the technical detail, we're using the consensus Ethereum Light Wallet, which works with this gas node, and um, the private keys are only stored in the browser, and it's communicating uh, with the node. And the smart contract design is not finished yet, we're still working on this. We will have a lookup contract where you find the users, and you will have your personal identity contract where all your, your attributes and your web ID is in there. 
and we had a global identity contract where you can find users and also the claims would be probably there. Yeah, and the future, over future overview, we have this digital identity with the map ID, and we have the additional attributes which can be stored there, and other users and companies could verify additional attributes. We are also still working on this. This will be um, JSON web token based. There will be hashes in somehow. We will have to get it out in the next months. And just the use case, um, because actually uh, my department at Fraunhofer, we are dealing with public services, so this is really related to our work. And it's usually if you want to need to share your driver license, and for example, to rent a car, you have the option to show the driver license physically, you can show it digitally with a service, and option three we are aiming to do is you, you verify the claim that you have it, have the, the, the license, like with this option, and you do it once, and you put it in the blockchain, and then you can use it all over again. Another use case in the future, hopefully, you can probably go to, to the Burger Hunt, and they, they tell that you have a driver license, Erica has it, they sign it with their, uh, with their key, and it's in the blockchain, so everybody can see that Erica is allowed to drive a car. It's just, that's the vision, what we want to do with such an identity. Yes. And we put it there in the, in the blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do that. Contract, well, Manuel can answer it, he's doing the contract. <laughs> Man, look up, we want to create a personal uh, account, a personal smart contract for every person, and that's a way how you can find your uh, your personal smart contract based on your keys. Yeah, that sounds great. So this is more like a look up contract. Okay. Have you some kind of notion about gas consumption in two years? Yeah. I, I noticed with the startups now coming up, I tried a couple and um, mm -hmm. I was stunned what I had to pay for saving my data. Mm -hmm. So um, it's early stage, so I think it's yeah, we, but there's a lot of interaction going on on, on your uh, yeah, yeah. telecom. So yeah, that's true. Do we have, we have some calculations? Yeah, we calculated at least for the creation of the uh, contract with the web ID, we calculated it's 11 cents, euro cents at the moment. At the moment, yeah. At the moment, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. All this, uh, your privacy, you have to pay for it. Any more questions? Maybe questions for you, Dean. Who will buy what? Uh, who will buy it? Yeah, it's actually like if you if you if you if you look at the payment option, or in general, who will use it? If it's eleven cents, you mean? I, I didn't get the. How do you make money? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> this this project is uh, at least for us. It's not about making money. So it's a, it's research, we, we try to evo uh, evolve this idea, and um, yeah, there is no, no real business concept right now. Well, I mean, at least not within the developers. Yeah. I mean, you reckon it's there? The, uh, <laughs> all the questions regarding that became but, uh, but actually, it's always with data. If you want to buy data, somebody's getting a fee, probably. So, you know, it's difficult. So you once had you encrypt your private key, mm -hmm. the user's private key. Mm -hmm. You use other keys to encrypt those keys? We're using we are deriving from the um, Ethereum private key another key 
And with this one, we will encrypt the web ID private key. And what, what about that key? <laughs> <laughs> which key? Which? The, the encryption key. Well, wh where you it's, it's deterministic. We can create it all, every time again from the. Hmm? Ah, the if, I, if I lost the original uh, key, my original private key from Ethereum? The web ID private key. It's, the, it's not the Ethereum private key. It's like this, uh, this Yolo.com <laughs> ecosystem has a web ID and this web ID has also a private key. It's signed with a key. And we're encrypting this key. And, and you, you are storing this key to someone else. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. You can derive from C. You have a C, like 12 words, you have to remember. Then you can derive yeah. a couple of public private keys from it. And you're just using a second one for encrypting. But what, what, what is the bit behind the scenes between this private key? Why so are you encrypting this private key? Because it's on the blockchain, so it's public. Your identity in the blockchain is, uh, everybody can yeah. see it. So and it's your private key. If you lost this encryption key, yeah, but that's, that's the thing we, we were talking about, that there is no solution right now. You have to store your private key somewhere. That's um, it's, it's a thing. Yeah, I don't know, you're probably a couple of you are using Ethereum, so you have your private key, so if you lose it. Yeah. We have this mechanism, this uh, uh, Ethereum Light Wallet is offering this, um, this method uh, to generate a 12-word human <coughs> readable seed. It's 12 English words. And we are actually offering to store this seed and not the very um, cryptic, uh, cryptic private key. But you have to remember or write down the seed. Yeah. It's still, that's still state of the art. Um, actually, we really talked to a lot of Ethereum guys here, and it's like this. And Uport is working on it, but they told us that uh, it will take at least a couple of months until they have the recovery the social recovery process in place. But then still it's not really self-sovereign because you rely on your friends to, to help you out. Yeah, actually, this was like it's a very like in the sense that this is a small project, and 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 we had to set some some requirements, scope, yeah. yeah, the scope, and we we said okay, Ethereum. It's complicated enough for, for the time we have, and um, it's like you have this Turing complete programming language, and it offers you for now everything you need. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, maybe better blockchains or other blockchains for this specific use case, maybe. Yeah. Sorry, those are the fundamental ideas to eventually perhaps move away from um, HTTP URIs as identifiers and rather introduce an extra layer of abstraction. And this is effort done by, for example, the ID. Uh, so the, yeah, the, that's uh, basically a non-human readable identifier that resolves a different data structure and different blockchain depending on. So there's, there's effort on that. There's also XDI, which is an alternative to RDF, which also deals with similar things. Uh, but in the, the long picture, the ideal would be to, to kind of decouple them, uh, or at least introduce a certain amount of portability, where you can change your identity, you can change your domain name, you can you can kind of move your data, but you can still maintain your identity, and this is kind of the golden, uh, the holy grail, so to say, at least for us at this point in time. So we're doing the little exploration step by step. This was a very simple, straightforward example of integration. I want to see how this works, how how well this used our needs. So this is by no means a state of the art. Uh, this is by no means a finished project. It's rather just kind of a bunch of people figuring things out. So um. yeah, a big issue is also always performance scalability. We have this lookup contract or this, uh, this um, the map with all identities. And we don't know how it behaves if there are millions of identities in there. We don't know. Same question for the web ID part. The, the stack, so the web ID, the solid sound is really attractive, and I think it, it is still very, I think it is still very attractive to this day because, probably get up, <laughs> sorry, 
uh, for turning my back here, but it is very attractive to this day because it promises this wonderful ecosystem where you have a bunch of identities, all of them use apps, you know, your data is on your part. So it is very, and it's still very much in development, you know, you see very smart people behind it, very smart people working on it. So, and it, it shows promise to a certain extent. And this is really the, at least to us, this is subjectively the weak point because some people would argue that DNS is not a problem. Um, and some people would argue that it is, and therefore you have uh, incentives. So. I, I don't think the, the uh, actually think as far as problems with relying on kind of web infrastructure go over lines, and DNS is a smaller one. The other one is I feel like while you have reliance on any kind of server, like it's not fully self-sovereign just because like regular people cannot operate their own servers. Like even I try to operate my own server and I have to do a bunch of maintenance on it every month, right? So yeah. <laughs> like it's if you go toward that model where like it's not it's the best you can possibly do is realistically federated, right? I think that's a very important point. There's some incentives as again on plug in freedom box, which is you know this kind of like out of the box thing, you plug it in the internet and you have your solid server identity there. So it really tries to abstract a lot of the technical concepts from normal people, but there's still troubleshooting but still maintain. So in it, it, it has issues, I mean, it has challenges. And I think you, you make a very good point here, actually, that as, as long as users have to operate their own service, there'll probably be vulnerabilities. And someone will argue that uh, centralized identity providers like Facebook would is probably be more, more secure than, they'll be more withstanding to denial of service attacks, to, to just malicious intent in general than your personal solid server. So, it, oh, it. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm taking over the conversation. Uh, I was just inspired by the previous question. What are the attack vectors like you identified with this server thing? Because I have something in mind which is basically updates to the servers. If everyone runs around the server, then you have to push updates and like uh, maybe you found some other like ways of like fuck with it basically. Yeah, I mean if someone doesn't like you and you host your own solid server on, on the Freedom Box, for example, the Freedom Box is limitations in terms of computations they can easily take it down really. So that's uh, that's not a problem, but uh, you know, you you basically would want every user to hold, to hold their own server and that server to be able to withstand the potential attack, you know, from a, a, medias, a million malicious agents. So it's kind of, it's a tough sort of equilibrium that needs to be found, uh, but there is a risk. There is a risk that the normal everyday user running their own server, self-hosting probably doesn't have the infrastructure to survive a malicious, uh, Intent, but the question is how, how malicious, like, who would be this bad guy attacking users? There's always the chance of uh, backing up that and moving to a different service. So, this, I think this is already out of the scope of, of uh, this presentation. We are really exploring these things as well, find them as we go, and as we kind of step around the ecosystem. So, yeah, we might not have the perfect answer for everything here, but we're willing to, to hear and discuss, definitely. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm only asking nasty questions because I'm inspired by the presentation, so we keep my brain going. Because, you know, we all worry about this stuff. Yeah, I'm not very good at giving nasty answers, so. <laughs> we just have more gear.